Hello again. I'm back. So this lecture is going to cover pharmacology. This is chapter 35, and it's antihypertensive drugs. So we'll start out talking about hypertension and blood pressure. What is blood pressure? So blood pressure is the measurement of the force of pumping blood against the walls of a person's arteries. Okay, And when we say hypertension, that means that the pressure is elevated, so they have high blood pressure. And typically, we're talking about it being sustained for a period of time. Um, when we talk about the different kinds of hypertension, the two you need to know, there's primary and then there's secondary. Primary hypertension means that we don't know why the patient's blood pressure is elevated. Um, we can call it essential hypertension, idiopathic, which means, uh, so primary hypertension, your blood pressure is elevated and we're not really sure what the cause of it is. And then there's secondary hypertension, which we know that the high blood pressure is the result of another disease. So for example, people with renal disease, kidney disease, will have elevated blood pressure because one of the roles of the kidneys is to control blood volume and blood pressure. So, so primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. When we talk about the numbers, blood pressure numbers, what's a normal blood pressure? And I hate the word normal, but we can talk about ranges or within normal limits, typical ranges. So hypertension is defined, generally speaking, as a reading systolically greater than 140 and then diastolically, I really go with the American Heart Association's greater than 70. Um, because if blood pressure diastolically is 80, then it doesn't take long for it to go higher than that. And anything over that is considered hypertension uh, and can be dangerous. And then the other end, the low end, what, what, how low is too low, I guess is the question. So the best thing that I can say is when we talk about blood pressure, if blood pressure is on the low end of the scale, my blood pressure, for example, runs about 100 over 60. And some people would say, oh, that's too low. Now, that's actually wonderful because I am not symptomatic. I'm not dizzy or lightheaded. I'm not, you know, not getting sufficient oxygenated blood. You can see I don't look cyanotic, so I'm perfusing. So blood pressure is too low when the patient is symptomatic, number one. In other words, they feel lightheaded or dizzy or they appear cyanotic. In other words, they're not getting enough oxygenated blood flow to their brain and their body, right? They're not perfusing. That's that word. And then, just in general terms, anything with the systolic under 90 and the diastolic under 50, we would be concerned because those numbers are low and we'd be worried about someone, you know, being symptomatic with a number that low. So what do we do about high blood pressure? Well, one of the things that we can do that's non-pharmacological is modification of things like lifestyle. So for example, if the patient's overweight, lose weight. Stress reduction, and I say this time and time again, if there is one thing that will kill us all quickly, it's stress. We all have stress, but we need to learn to manage stress and anxiety so that it doesn't affect us internally. Relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, meditation, yoga, you know, things that people enjoy to try to do those things and, and try to relax. Um, aerobic exercise. What do we mean? Cardiovascular exercise. In other words, you've got to break a sweat three times a week, you know, at least, and, and raise your heart rate. So aerobic exercise could be aerobics. It could be dance. It could be bicycling or spin class. It could be running. Those things are all aerobic activities, swimming, aerobic activities, okay? Uh, if you smoke, you must quit. So smoking is not good for you. It causes vasoconstriction, which also causes hypertension. Um, alcohol. I know the book says alcohol in moderation. You know, how much alcohol is safe? So nobody can really answer that question. That debate's been going on for a very long time. The bottom line is, is that alcohol consumption, period, is not healthy. So if the patient drinks, they really, they should be either eliminating it or at least cutting down. And then dietary changes. And I'm going to say this, the thing that kills more people, especially, especially African Americans, but you know, white people too, salt, just table salt, a spice, I promise you. 
you must decrease the sodium in your diet. Um, we tell patients that do have cardiovascular uh, diseases, usually it's 2,000 milligrams in a day. Somebody that's got a cardiovascular disease, 1,500 is even better. So the less, the better. Not using table salt is a step, but it's not the solution because there's hidden salt in all of the foods that we eat, especially canned vegetables, um, especially processed foods. So, you know, getting away from salt is one of the healthiest things that you can do. Now let's get to the meds. So what are the meds? So in this chapter, we're going to talk about beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, and centrally acting anti-adrenergic drugs, okay? The good news is, is that with two of these categories, there's really only one drug that I need for you to know about, okay? So beta blockers. Beta blockers are metoprolol, propanolol, atanolol. You hear a common denominator there, huh? Lol. The anti-adrenergic drugs, clonidine, clonidine, clonidine. The angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors are the prills, captopril, enalapril, lisinopril. You have angiotensin II receptor antagonists or ARBs, and they're the sartans. And then the aldosterone antagonist, which that's one drug also, and that's a plerinone, okay? There are also two other categories of drugs that are used to treat hypertension, but they are covered in different chapters. So calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, hiltiazem, they're covered in the anti-anginal and vasodilating drug uh, chapter. And diuretics are covered in the diuretic chapter. Okay, so see those chapters for information about those classifications of medications. So the must-know meds, we'll start with the ACE inhibitors or the PRILs. All of the drugs in this classification share the same common side effects and so on, okay? Lysinopril, enalapril, captopril, the prills. Please know all of them are potassium sparing. So in other words, they'll make your body hold on to potassium. So they run with them the risk of hyperkalemia. Um, a very common side effect with the prills is a dry hacking cough. For some people, it's just a mildly annoying cough. For others, it can be relentless, and we have to take the patient off of the ACE inhibitor. With the ARBs, the angiotensin II receptor blockers, and Sartans, Losartan, Valsartan, again, all of these can cause hyperkalemia. They are potassium sparing as well. And then one more thing you need to know is they affect renal function sometimes. So you need to be always monitoring renal function in a patient taking them. Renal function would be blood urea nitrogen, BUN, and creatinine are the two main labs you would be looking at. Aldosterone antagonists, that's that one drug, eplerinone, also can cause hyperkalemia, right? They're potassium sparing. This drug can cause hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia, and elevated liver enzymes and uric acid. So nursing, you know, interventions would be, you're going to be checking the patient's liver enzymes, AST and ALT, and their uric acid levels as well, okay? So in all three of those categories of drugs, the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists, all three of them work on this system in the kidneys that I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's the renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone system in the kidneys, but we'll get to that. Now, the last category are your beta blockers, okay? Beta blockers are a little bit different because where ACEs and ARBs and aldosterone antagonists affect a system going on in the kidneys to lower blood pressure, beta blockers lower the heart rate first. And by doing that, blood pressure will decrease, okay? Remember this, B, beta blockers, bradycardia. Right? That's easy to remember. One of, the, one of the main side effects is bradycardia. It can lower the heart rate too much. And here's another thing with, with beta blockers, and they're the LOLs, metoprolol, propanolol, atenolol. Uh, they can cause heart failure. So if your patient has just started a regimen with a beta blocker and they come back for their two-week follow-up and you see that the patient's got you know, swollen ankles, so they've got peripheral edema, 
Or when you're assessing your auscultating lungs and you hear crackles, that is significant for pulmonary edema or fluid in the lungs. That and they need to stop the drug, talk to the healthcare provider, get them on a different drug. Okay? We don't want them going into heart failure. You with me so far? Now, a real quick overview of the renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, aldosterone antidiuretic hormone system. I put a flow chart in on page 9 to try to kind of give you a visual on what's happening. But this was the best chart that I could find. I think it's easiest to follow. When your lungs release a chemical called ACE, it's angiotensin converting enzyme. They release this chemical. That chemical ACE goes to your kidneys because your lungs and your kidneys are BFF. Okay, they're best friends. So the ACE goes to the kidneys and that allows the process of this system. In other words, the renin is produced. Angiotensin 1 has been stimulated to be produced. Angiotensin 1 will convert to angiotensin 2 if the lungs have sent that ACE, that converting enzyme down. And then angiotensin 2 will stimulate the production of aldosterone, which then stimulates this antidiuretic hormone, ADH. So if a diuretic makes you pee, an antidiuretic makes you hold on to fluid. So this system that's going on in the kidneys 24-7 is how the kidneys manage fluid volume in the body. And by managing the volume of fluid, they're managing your blood pressure. A lot of fluid, blood pressure high. Get rid of some fluid, blood pressure goes down. Okay, we, we decrease peripheral resistance. And so with these medications we're talking about, the ACE inhibitors, well, what they do is they inhibit that angiotensin converting enzyme that's coming from the lungs. And by doing that, the process is just stopped right in the middle. So angiotensin 1 cannot convert to angiotensin 2. And so the patient does not hang on to extra fluid, okay? Not a diuretic. Don't confuse these with diuretics. Diuretics actively make you pull fluid and urinate, okay? These just stop this process that's going on in the kidneys. And then ARBs, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Well, they actually block the receptor sites that angiotensin 2 is supposed to attach to in order for aldosterone to be made. By blocking those receptor sites, process gets stopped right there. And then iplerinone, aldosterone antagonist, it actually stops the aldosterone from, you know, being received and then changing and, and making the body make antidiuretic hormone. So even though all three of those classifications of meds are working on the same system, they're just working at a different spot in the system, right? either somewhere towards the beginning, somewhere in the middle, or somewhere towards the end. And that is how they control blood pressure. Remember I said the beta blockers are the only ones that are different. Okay, they work with the heart first. So, you know, there's a, there's a very lengthy explanation on slides 10 and 11. Um, but, you know, you don't really need to know that. If you want to read it, of course, please do. But understand that, you know, that system that's going on in the kidneys is just getting stopped. Your kidneys are allowing fluid to just be released, not being held onto, and blood pressure will come down. Remember this, when it comes to side effects, any drug that lowers blood pressure can lower it too much, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? So hypotension, yes, yes, is a potential side effect of every single medication that affects blood pressure, okay? So make sure that you understand that. Before you administer any of these medications, you're always going to make sure that you're getting the patient's vital signs. And when it comes to blood pressures, make sure you've got the proper cuff size and do a manual, not an electronic. Okay. Do a manual blood pressure. And you should always check for orthostasis. And in other words, you're going to do a blood pressure when they're supine. You're going to do a blood pressure when they're sitting. And you're going to do a blood pressure when they're standing and record all of those blood pressures. And if diuretics are being used as far as part of the regimen to control their blood pressure, daily weights, daily weights, daily weights, daily weights, daily weights. Okay, can't say that enough. Um, when we talk about 
outcomes. So when we give a, a drug to lower blood pressure, well, we hope the blood pressure comes down. Right, so we're looking for an optimal response to the therapy. Blood pressure is is staying in an acceptable range. The patient is, you know, meeting their their needs are being met as far as managing any adverse reactions, and they understand the med and they're compliant with the med. Uh, the next slide gives you some nursing diagnoses associated with this. I will bring up one more very important point. When it comes to patients who are non-compliant with hypertensive meds, the number one reason for men to be non-compliant is erectile dysfunction. Okay, that's the number one reason. Almost all of these medications, by lowering blood pressure, can cause a problem, right? And so it's something that you have to be able to have an honest conversation with your patient with. You know, when you talk to your patient and you say, you know, hey, you're not taking your medications, can you help me understand what's going on? Is there a reason? And you know, let them talk to you about it because with these medications, then sildenafil, aka Viagra, can be given. There's not a contraindication. So they need to be open and honest and have that conversation because if their blood pressure is high, high blood pressure that is sustained can cause severe damage. It will destroy their kidneys. It can cause a stroke. So there's so many things that the high blood pressure can cause. So you want to make sure that they understand they need to talk about noncompliance and we need to figure out a way to help them be compliant. And, you know, they're going to feel fatigued. They're going to feel tired, uh, a little lethargic. If their blood pressure has been high for a you know, period of time, their body will adjust to that high blood pressure. Not that it's healthy, it's not, it's dangerous, but their body, your bodies are amazing. They'll adjust to so many things. When we lower the blood pressure, patient's going to feel, oh, I'm so tired all the time. That's expected. And that typically will resolve over time. All right. And it's something that you want to make sure that you have that conversation with your patient. Um, make sure they're not dizzy. Make sure that they're not experiencing orthostasis. So if there is a 10 millimeter or more drop in blood pressure, when the patient changes position. In other words, if I go from lying to sitting, if blood pressure drops 10 millimeters of mercury, that's orthostasis. That's too big of a drop. They're going to feel dizzy. Um, and the same thing sitting to standing. Blood pressure drops more than 10, they're going to be dizzy. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're assessing for that ongoing. Okay, you're going to tell them rise slowly. Don't make any sudden moves. Okay, um, if they're getting up out of bed, Sit up for a couple minutes, dangle your feet over the edge of the bed, and then, you know, you make the attempt to slowly rise, okay? Um, I don't think there's anything more, really, the meat and potatoes of this whole chapter is on those pages in the beginning where I talk about the prills, hyperkalemia, dry cough, beta blockers, bradycardia can cause heart failure, right? Those are the things that you want to concentrate on because if, if you get a question that asks you, your patient has been taking spironolactone, that's a potassium sparing diuretic. In other words, it makes you hold on to potassium. And then we give them a prescription for an ACE inhibitor, potassium sparing too. You're worried about hyperkalemia, aren't you? Right? Understand the line of questioning. Do your ATI. All right? Good skill. We'll be on to the next one in a minute. Okay? Peace and peace.